Okay, we're happy to have you with us. I'm Tom Ivaco with the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy, also known as Close Up. I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of the Ford School and Close Up to Weill Hall for today's event. This is sure to be an engaging discussion on one of the most important policy topics facing the state of Michigan today, reform in our correction system. I'd like to point out that we will have time at the end of the panel discussion for question and, uh, questions and answer with the audience. We have uh, some cards and pencils placed around the auditorium. If you have a question, please write it down on one of the cards and then uh, hold your hand up. We'll have some people come by to uh, pick up those cards from you. Today's event is co-sponsored by Close Up and the Ford School and has been organized by Professors Jeffrey Moranoff and David Harding from the University of Michigan, as well as Jeffrey Padden from Public Policy Associates Incorporated. Mr. Padden is serving as the moderator today and he will introduce the rest of the panelists, but it's my pleasure to first introduce Mr. Padden. Jeffrey Padden is the founder and president of Public Policy Associates, a firm that works across the nation in public policy research, development, and evaluation. Mr. Padden began working in corrections policy in 1975 when he was first elected to the Michigan House of Representatives. He chaired the House Committee on Corrections for eight years and served on the Judiciary Committee, chairing the Subcommittee on Sentencing Guidelines. For the past six years, Mr. Padden has led Public Policy Associates' work as a partner with the Michigan Department of Corrections and the Michigan Council on Crime and Delinquency in the leadership of the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative, the topic of today's discussion. Mr. Padden's experience of over 30 years in public policy has included roles as Deputy Director of the Michigan Department of Commerce, Director of the Governor's Human Investment Project, and five terms in the Michigan House of Representatives. He holds a bachelor's degree from Wayne State University and a master's degree from the Kennedy School at Harvard. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Jeffrey Patton. I am very happy to be a part of this panel discussion today on the politi policy and politics of the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative, and particularly to be doing it here in Ann Arbor at the Gerald R. Ford uh, School of Public Policy. Uh, the folks who participate in the work of this, uh, this school are uniquely interested in and committed to improving public policy in Michigan and around the country. Uh, so it's a good thing that you're here to learn a, a little bit more about the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative. As promised, we will be talking not just about the policy issues themselves, but also about the politics. Uh, transforming the way state government or any big state government agency does business is a stunningly difficult challenge, and yet that is exactly the challenge that the MPRI has undertaken under the leadership of Governor Granholm and Director Pat Caruso. It's, it's, it's important that it has been framed and is in fact an initiative that's aimed at improving public safety. My experience in corrections policy over the past uh, 30 plus years has, has shown me that there really is a, a sort of a false choice that have been set up between doing the things that would prepare a prisoner for successful uh, reintegration into the community or being tough on crime. The Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative resolves that false choice by showing that those really are one and the same. If we prepare people better to reintegrate into society, then we are in fact protecting the public better. I will uh, talk a little bit about, uh, an, I, I will give you a bit of an over overview of, of the Prisoner Reentry Initiative, uh, but before I do that, I want to let you know who uh, are the members of this very illustrious and well-qualified panel. Uh, Pat Caruso has been a very creative director of the Michigan Department of Corrections. I'm not going to read the, the bios that, that you were handed as you walked in, in the door, but I'll, I'll tell you what I really know about these people. Uh, Pat has been willing to take risks, and it requires a risk taker to undertake the kind of a profound transformation that uh, the department has been undergoing in the past seven years and the policy uh, apparatus that surrounds it. So what we have in Pat Caruso is a leader 
who has been unafraid of taking on the, the challenges of making that big, powerful transformation, which involves not just changing the written policies, but changing attitudes, changing culture, uh, re-educating how many workers? 16,000 currently? Down to 16,000. Down to 16,000 employees of the Department of Corrections. Every single one of them has to learn what's different about the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative. So Pat has been the kind of leader who would take on that challenge. In Representative Alma Wheeler-Smith and John Proust, we have a Republican and a Democrat in the opposite order. Let's see if I can keep that straight. The Democratic chair of the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Corrections and the Republican vice chair of that committee. Together, they are responsible for shaping um, uh, a good portion of the budget decisions. They, they sometimes consult with the Senate on that, I guess. But at least on the House side, they are the two leaders who are responsible for uh, shaping the, the, the funding decisions. And, and of course, funding, funding dramatically affects policy. You've heard that bipartisanship and collaboration are dead in the Michigan legislature. Alma and John are living, breathing evidence that that's not quite true. Uh, I have watched them collaborate over the last several years to, to learn more about the policy issues involved, involved in the MPRI and to try to figure out how the legislature can pay, play a constructive role in supporting the transformation that Pat and, and the governor have been, have been proposing. And finally on the panel is Peter Luke. And uh, I, I've known Peter Luke for a long time and I told him a little while ago that it's hard for me to think of him as the grizzled veteran reporter since I uh, ran across you first many, many years ago. But Peter is, is a very astute observer of the Lansing policy and political scene. So, Having Peter as a member of this panel, let's, let's all of you and all of us take a step back from, from what Pat and Alma and John are deeply embroiled in every single day and tell you what he sees from that outside perspective. So that's our, that's our panel and I think we are all very fortunate to have them with us today. A quick bit of history about the MPRI. This was one of uh, Governor Granholm's initial policy initiatives. And uh, it, it, in fact, she had embraced it prior to becoming governor. The planning for this began in her very first year in office, in fact, within a few months of uh, Governor Granholm taking office. And the first real uh, efforts around implementation took place uh, less than two years later. It's important to understand MPRI is an evidence-based practice. That means it's based on research that's been done all around the country over the past 20 years. We were never able to invent anything like the MPRI when I was a member of the legislature because the research base simply wasn't there to justify uh, a major uh, retooling uh, of corrections such as this. It's organized into three phases. The in-prison phase, which is the getting ready phase, the going home phase, which connects community uh, with prisons in a way that's profoundly different than, than used to be the case. It used to be that uh, the prison walls didn't just keep prisoners in, it kept everyone else out. The staying home phase is, is the process of making sure that all, all of the progress toward reducing risk while folks are in prison continues once folks are in the community. I mentioned that uh, Pat Caruso has presided over these profound cultural changes and it is not easy for folks who have been uh, employed at the Department of Corrections for 10, 20, 30 years saying, well, gee, next Monday morning we're going to, going to be doing business differently. Big challenge and takes a lot of effort, a lot of planning, a lot of preparation. It is uh, uh, really uh, amazing for me to stand here after being involved in the MPRI since 2003 and say it is now a statewide initiative with 18 regions serving all 83 counties and that every prisoner who, is, uh, who comes into the Michigan prisons is touched by the MPRI. There is a strong focus on employment readiness because employment is one of the, one of the factors that really uh, affects the likelihood that, that somebody will be able to successfully reintegrate into the community. And that uh, employment readiness is supported by uh, the close collaboration between 
the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative and Michigan's employment delivery system. The MPRI has gone from zero to serving uh, about 11,000 prisoners per year. That's everybody who comes in the front door. They all get uh, uh, what's referred to as a compass assessment, which assesses uh, the risks and strengths of each prisoner. Tra transition accountability plans are then built based on those specific risks, and those plans guide the service delivery in prison and out into the community. Uh, over time, everybody who's released will be a part of the MPRI, and that will amount to something like 12,000 prisoners per year. And they won't all get the same thing. This is not a one-size-fits-all uh, program at all. Uh, in fact, the MPRI is most effective in serving, uh, in reducing the risk posed by, by moderate and high-risk prisoners. The MPRI is a complete system ch change, so it really requires everybody to be involved. Uh, the, the, the promise made by Governor Granholm was one of the important strengths of this initiative, and, and very complimentary to that is, that is that the governor had exactly the right team to implement it in, in Pat Caruso and former Deputy Director Dennis Schrantz and Director Caruso's top management team. They have all been unrelenting in moving this thing from, from zero to 100 in a very quick period of time. Uh, the fact that it's driven by evidence of what reduces recidivism, I think, is one of the things that gives it credibility. If we were just talking about providing services to be nice to prisoners, I think we know what the results would be in terms of its sustainability within the legislature and the public. So uh, it is a state-level strategy that focuses on public safety, but provides within a broad framework lots of uh, uh, local flexibility and leadership. Uh, there have been, there's preliminary evidence of what works. Uh, we are still not to the point where we can establish a firm causal relationship between what the MPRI is doing and the results that are being achieved, uh, but all the preliminary indications are very positive. Uh, it, it used to be that one out of two prisoners would go back to prison within 24 months. Now that's more like one out of three. That's a huge increase, a huge improvement. And that means that there are over 2,000 prisoners uh, who would have come back, who would have been expected to come back, who didn't. That translates into real crimes that did not happen. The prison population is down dramatically and that translates into huge cost savings for the state of Michigan or, or will over time. There are a number of other indications of the, the kind of success that the MPRI has, has enjoyed and, and over time we, we expect that to, uh, to, to continue to grow. The, prelimi the uh, prior research indicated that for, for medium and high risk prisoners results as good as a 50% reduction in, in return to prison rate uh, is possible. We haven't got there yet with the MPRI, but the MPRI is really the first effort in the whole country to integrate lots of different practices at, in, at the in-prison level, the transition point, and the community level uh, to pull together all of, all of those uh, practices into one big system change. So with that, I do want to turn to our panel, and uh, we'll start with Pat Caruso. Pat is the director of the, uh, the department. Uh, I, I know everybody is eager to, eager to hear what the MPRI looks like from your point of view. Thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you to the university for again hosting this um, discussion. I often talk about reentry as an opportunity that grew from crisis. And the crisis was uh, an incredible economic crisis, which struck our state in 2001, ahead of most of the rest of the country. And it caused us to stand back and look at what was going on. And that led into, obviously, the um, election of a new governor. Jeff mentioned the governor came in with this already on her radar. And so I've been fortunate to have been part of this from the very start, been the director now for seven years. 
and uh, was actually the deputy director of the prison system at the time of the election. I'm not sure we would have gotten here. We certainly wouldn't be here now had that crisis not occurred. We were at a point where the Department of Corrections budget consumed 25% of the general fund of the state of Michigan, one in three state employees. It was just not sustainable. And we had gotten there really the way almost every other state got there because what happened in Michigan was just like every other state where through a series of um, policy decisions, sometimes driven by politics, but, but I honestly would say oftentimes driven by good intentions, but good intentions not based on evidence that those policies would actually make any difference in terms of making people safer. But through the implementation of a lot of policies, which became law, our prison population started to um, just go through the roof. And that's what happened all around the country. And so we um, created scenarios in communities all over the state where we were the, the main employer. You know, I'm from the Upper Peninsula, and we have prisons all across the UP where um, good people come to work every day and work in our prisons. Uh, they didn't create this scenario. They're just part of it. But they uh, do rely on those jobs, and those communities rely on this job. And that story is something that has been repeated all over the United States. In Michigan, we decided we had to make a change before most other states made that decision. And um, we did that initially because we couldn't afford to do it. But one of the things we realized very early on is that the way we were uh, running the Department of Corrections, the way we were incarcerating people, the way we looked at what our focus was, we were not making the citizens of our state safer. They were not safer because, as Jeff mentioned, one and two came back who got out. They were not safer if we're spending $2 billion of the general fund running a prison system, monies that could be available for something else, whether it's public education or health care or housing or transportation, whatever it is, things that may make a bigger difference, police on the streets, that, that we weren't holding up our end of the bargain if our mission is to protect the public. And so we made a decision to change how we ran the department and to change the culture in the department and to start focusing on success and start measuring our success based on what happened as people went through that system and when they got out. And um, that's what we're here to talk about today and some of the underlying pieces of that, the political part of it, which is very interesting. I have a book I often refer to which talks about how over a period of decades our country converted from a military industrial based economy to a prison industrial based economy. And uh, though it sounds very offensive, and I was offended when I first heard it, I will tell you there's a lot of truth to that. And though we certainly do not overtly incarcerate people to provide jobs, we have created an economy that relies on those big prisons and the numbers of people we incarcerate to provide jobs. And I, there's tremendous moral implications of that, but it is the circumstances we found ourselves in. As we decided to change the direction we were going, and as we decided to put policies in place in our system that would result in a lower population in our prison system, we had to face the politics of what that would mean. And so all of these communities around the state who, in many cases, we had forced to take prisons. We put them in the communities who either wanted them because they were desperate for jobs or they did not have the political ability to stop us. So we forced those prisons in, now love their prisons. Now we're saying, hey, we're successful, our population's dropping. I can guarantee you there are not any communities in Michigan who think success looks like you're closing their biggest employer. And, and that was the message that we have had to deliver. I, to deliver. I've delivered that message personally in many communities in the state. The politics of that are very difficult. I have faced uh, employees on picket lines whose prison was closing and whose jobs were being eliminated, who would have a job, but perhaps an hour from where they worked. Um, faced employees holding signs, which read such disturbing things as blood on your hands, Jenny, referring to the governor. and. Um, talking to me about keeping with them at every minute a binder with the information on every parolee who failed. And I always say to them, if you're going to keep a binder on every parolee who failed, I hope you have a stack to the ceiling of the thousands who've succeeded. 
because we really can't talk about one without the other because this is the ultimate human business. Our detractors will always say, the default argument is always, don't do this, something bad will happen. I'm going to give you a clue. Something bad will happen. Something bad happens no matter what we do. We can eliminate parole, we can cut it in half, we can increase it. In my world, something bad will happen. If we are going to structure our lives around a fear of something bad will happen, we should have all stayed home today because something bad could have happened before we got here. Something bad might happen yet while we're here or on our way home. We have to be strong enough and courageous enough to make policy based on what evidence tells us and what really protects people, not a fear of something bad will happen. Interestingly, there's also been the political pushback from groups who are our natural advocates, though I think that many of the advocates have been pleased to see the cultural change in our department and the focus on success. There are also many individuals who are frustrated by perhaps things not taking um, place as quickly as they would like, sometimes a belief that um, I often hear that we have an incentive to keep our population up because the federal government gives us X amount of dollars for every prisoner we have incarcerated. That is not true. If anyone believes that to be true, that is not true, but I do hear that. I have had people who are advocating for a smaller population tell me that we intentionally release the people we believe are the most dangerous and the most likely to fail because then we'll be able to say, see, we told you, we tried, but it doesn't work. We can go back to the good old days of a big prison system. I will tell you those are not the good old days. And uh, if we go back to having to refill those prisons, we have failed. Three years ago, Exactly this week, three years ago, we hit our highest population ever. It was 51,554 prisoners. Today, we have 44,900 people incarcerated in Michigan. We are down to about 1,700 women. We have reduced the population of women incarcerated in Michigan by about 30%. It was a very significant reduction in um, the numbers of women who are in prison in Michigan. The issue in Michigan is length of stay. People do a lot of time in Michigan. Going back to the policies I talked about, whether it's because of consecutive sentencing, you must complete this sentence before you finish that one, whether it's because of um, the long indeterminate sentencing we have in Michigan, we have people doing one day to life, whether it's because of the fear of being accused of early release, something I hear all the time, parole is not early release, we are in a system where judges sentence you to a minimum sentence. The max is set by statute based on the crime. Judge has no discretion over that. Parole is not an early release. Not a day goes by that I don't read about this huge early release program I'm running in the state of Michigan. No one's getting out early. We have no legal authority to get anyone out early. What we have done is change our culture to focus on collaboration inside our prison, inside our communities, to focus on success. We have made a decision in the worst economy in the country to reinvest one-third of our savings into the types of activities and opportunities which the evidence tells us will, will allow offenders to be more successful. Additional programming in prisons, additional beds in our communities for those who need some kind of residential treatment. Additional uh, tethers, GPS tethers, where the parole board feels comfortable with someone outside of prison if they have that resource. We've hired 200 additional agents in the last year. So we're reinvesting our money, something other states are not doing. We're trying to focus on what really makes people safer and making decisions based on risk, not making decisions just based on emotion or based on fear, and especially fear of being wrong. Because as I said, something bad will happen. These are human beings. We're all human beings on every side of this equation. 100% of those for whom we're responsible are convicted felons. And so, so that is what we in our business deal with every day. People ask me every day, don't you live in fear of the one bad crime? This is a business where, where that, that is, that one, you're always one phone call away from that happening. But if we're afraid of that happening, then we're in the wrong business. We've got to find something else to do. Because I would 
suggest that, that the citizens of this state look to us to make the decisions that make them safer. And I am 100% convinced, 100% convinced, what we are doing in this state is making our citizens safer and our communities safer. And as we are able to successfully reduce that population and reinvest those monies in our communities, in activities and behaviors that make communities safer, then we have come full circle. I tell people frequently, it may be an opportunity that grew from crisis, but if we were today to not have ever experienced that crisis, if today Michigan wins the equivalent of the lottery and money is never going to be an issue forever, I would not change the direction we're going because we're going the right direction. And I am convinced we're doing the right thing. And I'm going to close my remarks with that and um, turn it to my fellow panelists. And we'll be happy to take questions later in the presentation. Thank you, Director Caruso. I'm Representative Alma Wheeler-Smith, and I'm in my 14th year in the Michigan Legislature. And I have a couple of different perspectives on MPRI. Uh, when I started in the Senate on the Corrections Subcommittee, we were in a period of um, let's keep them in as long as we can. Uh, maximum sentences were being served. And what I learned early is that 95% of these folks are coming out. And they need to come out into a community with some skills and some abilities behind them that allow them to come out safely. And at that point in time, and well, I was in the Senate, it was in the um, mid and late 90s, we were not doing a lot of rehabilitation. Um, and prisoners were not coming out with the skills, the training, or the education that they needed to turn things around for themselves and their families when they entered the community. And one day, as I was uh, serving on the, when I served on the county commission, the sheriff of Washtenaw County came to me and looked me dead in the eye and said, I am not the mental health institution for the state of Michigan. And I thought, what is he talking about? And so he went on to elaborate. He said, you know, almost a third of the people that I'm seeing in the county jail have mental health issues. And we are incarcerating them instead of putting them into a health facility where they can get the real help that they need. Yes, they've committed crimes. Yes, I, our fellow citizens have called and said, there's this guy and I feel threatened because he's walking around my house muttering and you have to do something about him. So he ends up in jail. After a number of those, oh, those arrests and after a number of incidents, sometimes um, assaultive, they would end up in the prison system of the state of Michigan with no mental health help. We were incarcerating for a long time, as the director pointed out, and it wasn't doing us any good. We would return people with mental health problems back to the streets of their communities <laughs> without any backup. The MPRI program started out um, in the community at release. And some of us would argue that that was the wrong point. Um, should have started with intake and worked people through. But as the director pointed out, we were in an economic crunch and we needed to deal with the people who were coming out. We needed to make sure that they had an opportunity for employment, for housing, and for health care. And MPRI was designed in its pilot phases to have some community or each of the five communities address certain specific issues that they thought were key to their communities. Some took on health care, some took on housing, and others took on employment. Let's see what happens if we can tackle a specific area of need for the returning population. The evidence base that we've garnered over the last few years when MPRA has been in place has shown that it really is a combination of all three working in each community. And we are trying to get a program together that actually has those three threads at work as we try to weave a safety net for people who are returning to the community. The 
yes, people are going to fail when they come out. Um, prior to MPRI, we had some spectacular failures of our parolees. Um, and they were headline issues. I was on the school board in the South Lyon Community School District, and we had three young people murdered in Oakland County by a parolee. Um, that was a tragedy for the community, but it was something that could not have been foreseen by the parole board. Um, certainly was addressed as quickly as possible, but the legislature's response was a lack of understanding of the fact that we are in fact dealing with human beings and that there will be a spectacular failure, which becomes an anecdotal reason that we wrap public policy around. So we took that one incident and all paroles stopped. It was um, a fascinating look at the line that the department will often show us of how paroles went up and then suddenly there's a plunge. Well, when you see that plunge, there was one anecdotal incident. And there you go, no paroles happening. And then finally the parole board gains a little courage and the legislature backs off a bit and you see the parole rate go back up. Um, we can't, in good conscience and in good public policy, approach our issues and our policy with an anecdotal incident that makes us respond with lasting policy changes that have done um, very little for public safety, but a whole lot for increasing the cost of prison system in the state of Michigan. I would like to tell you, I remember when the population was 7,000, but I don't. Um, I started working when the population was probably at about 15,000. And we have seen a dramatic increase because of policy decisions that were made on length of sentence and the fact that we wanted to punish. We were tough on crime. And we had to be tougher than our neighboring states. Michigan has the, long, the, the more difficult sentencing guidelines in the country. And we really are not flexible about what we do. Our parole board, as the director pointed out, has been given some confidence in the decisions they make because we have some evidence-based instruments in the system at use so that they can look at what the prisoner has done in the way of programming and education while in the system. Um, whether or not they can be successful on the outside by the coping skills that they've learned on the inside and that they're able to demonstrate. But we have to change the policy that is behind the length of sentence. And we have, um, in the last few years, begun an effort to look at the sentencing guidelines and re-examine them and make a decision, Senate and House, on whether or not adjustments can be made in those sentencing guidelines. We're not finding great success in that area. So we look at another approach. Um, you know, do we offer good time for prisoners? We canceled that out, and with it went a couple of good programs. But canceling out good time meant that people were unable to um, get out early. They could only get out past their minimum release date. So we were holding people longer yet again. The change that we're looking for in the um, good time or 85 percent um, minimum would let us release more prisoners from the system and prisoners who are safer to be released, safer for public safety, because they pose less of a risk than those who are past their earliest release date who have been held in the system um, rejected by the parole board one to four times, but are still beyond their earliest release date and become those individuals that we tell the department you have to look at to find that next release cohort from. And the department would have a lot more success for the community 
and for public safety if they could look at people who are at 85 percent of their minimum. But the comeback is we have truth in sentencing here in Michigan. Well, there are a whole lot of states, every state in the state in the country has truth in sentencing. But what we find is that Michigan is truthful at 100 percent, and 36, I believe, other states are truthful at 85 percent, and the federal government is truthful at 85 percent. It becomes a rhetorical question of um, what is truth. And truth is what you tell people it is. And if we tell people truth is 85 percent of a sentence, then that you know, should fulfill the rhetorical question of what is truth in sentencing. We had challenging economics that began this process toward the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative, and then we were hit with Calamity Jane um, in terms of a national collapse in the economy, which exacerbated where we are and how quickly we are looking at changes in public policy. But we aren't changing in haste to create a more um, dangerous climate for the citizens in the community. We are acting again with what we believe is good evidence-based information that lets us make decisions on who can leave the system and who should stay in longer. The more confidence we can give our parole board in making that decision is certainly helpful to the outcome. So we have increased the, youth, uh, the use of GPS systems and we have gone from um, a GPS that is not real-time to real-time GPS so that our parole agents have the opportunity to see exactly where somebody is and at any moment in time to know when they are violating boundaries that are put around people that they should never see, never talk to. Um, and that has given the parole board and the communities a lot more confidence in who is in the community. It, the MPRI program has certainly created challenges for communities in, that have facilities. Um, as the director pointed out, we assigned some facilities to certain communities and then others were, you know, begging us to take them for jobs. I was with the director when we were closing a camp in the UP and then went with one of my colleagues on a tour of the prisons in the UP and the hostility that I encountered on that, the early prison section, we did three, um, was interesting because they were sure we were there to announce a closure. And we finally allayed that concern and said, no, we're here to see how you're working with MPRI, how it's working for you, what kinds of changes you think we need to make. There are some changes I would still like to see in MPRI, and one of them is a, having a recommendation come from the people in the prison system who work closely with the prisoners. I think the guards and the social workers and the medical staff are key components of the um, time in prison that people spend and certainly have an opportunity to recognize who is ready um, to be released and who should probably never be released and to make that recommendation to the parole board. How that's done to protect their privacy so that they're not um, creating a hostile environment for their own workplace is a discussion I will have with the director. But um, the, there are a number of things I think we can continue to do and we will continue to work on as we move through our phase of the last budget process for me, um, hopefully not for Representative Prose. Thank you for that endorsement, I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I'm John Prose, state representative from Michigan's great Southwest. For those of you who weren't aware, I-94 doesn't end at about exit 75. <laughs> it keeps going all the way to the border and along Lake Michigan, along the border of Indiana too. Um, so I have the good fortune of living uh, in, in the great Southwest and uh, can take this discussion in any number of ways. You've been given a very good overview, obviously, from the director. And Jeff, thank you for in inviting us and the good, f good folks at Gerald R. Ford School. It's great to be here as a great Spartan grad also, so I appreciate that very much. Um, I, we did joke, Peter and I, on the way in. It, he says, boy, this is the time to be here at the University of Michigan during the Final Four, right? Isn't that what you said? Right. Exactly. We, we commented. <laughs> We commented, and we're not quite sure what that's time the, uh, that's exactly right. We, we, the first time Peter ever allowed words to be put 
in his mouth. That's right. Did you like that? <laughs> That's how legislators put it in the, uh, in the reporter's mouth. Um, we can take it in any number of ways, the discussion. I think what I'll do is, is provide a perspective that I have being in my third and final term in the House of Representatives uh, and having spent now three years in my fourth year with Representative Smith um, as my chairman on the Appropriations Subcommittee for Corrections. And, and uh, I made the comment earlier today, we were all together with the director and many of the folks from the department as it related to looking at the Senate's past version of the budget and beginning the work that Alma just mentioned, we're, we're beginning now in the House of Representatives based upon the budget itself. And I, I jokingly said, we took in a lot of information today. It's like drinking through a fire hose. Uh, with the depth and the breadth of this particular budget, the $2 billion budget or just under the $2 billion budget that we have, it, it, because it is so complicated, um, from my perspective as a legislator, I, I came in to this budget in the very early days of MPRI's rollout, which at that point was just simply a pilot program, a pilot program in eight counties. Um, my home county of Berrien was one of those counties that was participating in it and was encouraged um, uh, by the early uh, wraparound services. Uh, you know, Berrien County has, has several communities that bring an awful lot of folks back to our, uh, our home communities after they've served time in prison. And one of the early lessons I learned was is that we, in aggregate, parole or release the entire population of our prison system about every three years or thereabouts, I think is how the numbers go. Uh, and, and as Alma had said, 95% get out. We're going to have them back in our community. So the question is, uh, what are we doing to ensure um, the level of public safety that we would like to see? And what are we doing to ensure that it isn't just a bus ticket home and good luck, but how can we make sure that those folks are given the best services possible? What that has done in, in, in a couple of different ways in our local communities is create uh, some partnerships with agencies and providers who can assist in that process. Uh, what a novel concept. Um, it's great that we're doing that. I think community corrections was probably envisioned to be that in the, in the previous days uh, when community corrections was something different than what it is today. Uh, but the challenge that, that has come from that, though, is that in this era of, of declining revenues, yet increasing responsibilities and goals and objectives to take care of folks in our communities who are finding themselves in hard times, uh, that cost shift has, has impacted our local providers pretty significantly uh, as they try to assist the department and the parole board when they send folks back to our communities uh, in those wraparound services. Uh, Alma and I just today, in fact, after we finished the hearing, spent a few moments uh, quietly after the reporters jumped us. Um, and we discussed a couple of those challenges in our communities. Transportation is one of the very first challenges, of course, that many communities face. Uh, unlike some of our larger urban areas, I live in more of a rural area, if you, if you had to call it that, and we don't have very good transportation services available to folks who don't have driver's licenses and can't drive, or they don't have access to vehicles. Um, and then when talking today with, or in this past couple of months, with the director of the Michigan Works Agency that has Barry and Cass and Van Buren, Southwest Michigan area, and is a very good supporter of MPRI, provides many of the services for those particular individuals coming back to our community when they do come back, to helping them to achieve a skill level necessary to even enter the workforce again. Um, he is finding that of the 511 current numbers of parolees in Barry and Cass and Van Buren County, he's able to place only about 10% in jobs. Now, when MPRI was a pilot in Berrien County, we were, he was placing anywhere between 50 and 60 percent, he said, and any number of reasons why the 30 to 40 to 50 percent were not being placed. But we're at a time right now when we know that there is a glut of employees with certain degrees of talent. Those, those folks who are unemployed today are competing now uh, for those jobs and competing pretty fiercely for those jobs. And at the same time, we're finding ourselves with many more people coming out of our prison system with felony convictions and now seeking those jobs. And also, it takes a pretty courageous employer these days to decide that they'd take an MPRI individual or an individual who, in fact, is, is uh, coming out of our prison system. So we're facing many significant challenges and, I think, threats. I think a threat 
that also exists, which is why Alma and I worked very closely to inform our incoming freshman representatives of what MPRI was and is, and as it continues to uh, become a part of our community operations in all of our counties, all 83 counties, we worked closely together to try with, uh, with uh, our friends at uh, uh, Public Policy Associates to, to ensure that we get some information to them, because in term limits, folks, people are turning over all the time. They don't have nearly the same information or understanding of what it is that's, that's happening in our communities and what's happening in the Department of Corrections. Um, I'll remind you, I, even after three full years, I'm just barely dangerous enough to understand what's going on. Um, and that has shifted almost entirely the public policy debate in our legislature, making it all the more difficult for Representative Smith and others to pursue um, the policy uh, discussion as it relates to good time. Um, because it's very easy to just simply take the soundbite of, you mean to tell me 10 years isn't 10 years? I'm going to run into them in the grocery store in, three, in seven years or seven and a half years. And there is a very strong push on the prosecutors of Michigan to say, absolutely not. We're not going to overturn good time. Why would we do that and then tell our victims and victims' families, sorry, that isn't the truth. Um, and as Alma said, the truth is what we tell them. Well, at this point, we're telling them 10 years, if that is in fact the minimum sentence. Uh, so we find ourselves really with an educational process for all of the new representatives and senators who make these public policy decisions. So uh, I give a great deal of credit to the department uh, for working in this very challenging time. This is one department of many, obviously in the state that has an awful lot to deal with. Uh, but we can come at this from a very succinct and direct position that we agree on wholeheartedly, regardless of Republican or Democrat, which is how can we make sure that, that the services that are provided, whether in the prison or outside of the prison, allow for the best opportunities for public safety and for the success of that person coming back into our community as a, as a citizen contributing to the benefits that our state provides. Uh, clearly those are the goals and objectives that the Department of Corrections has and that we have as public policymakers. Uh, the hope and goal would be that we continue to educate our colleagues uh, about how we can get to the end of that process with success. And it's not going to be an easy situation. In particular, the greatest threat is exactly what both Director Caruso and Representative Smith just said. There will be a bad thing that happens, and it will likely point to a parolee and quite possibly a parolee on MPRI. And when that happens, the contraction in the legislature is likely to make it even more challenging from a public policy perspective, which is why the education is so critical today. So I'll leave it at that point, and I'm sure the questions will lead us in many new directions, and it's great to be on the panel and be here today. Thank you. Um, the state senator whose seat John wants to uh, is running for this year, Harry Gast from uh, St. Joe, said in uh, 1988 that prison costs were, are eating us alive. Harry was chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee at that point. In 1986, the Department of Corrections budget was $389 million, and in the budget he was dealing with in FY89, it had grown to $633 million. Um, and we all know now it's a, a billion nine. And in terms of the media's role in all of that, there is an axiom in journalism, particularly in the assignment desks at TV stations, particularly in probably Detroit, if it bleeds, it leads. And crime stories have a, uh, a, a real hold on the uh, public's imagination in, in a lot of ways, and they're obviously ratings grabbers. Another tenet of journalism is, um, you know, what do you put in the lead? Who, what, where, when, how, and why? Most crime stories don't have a why to them. Uh, a lot of bad things happen. Um, if there is a why, or if a why can be applied to a story, that story has legs. So why did a crime occur? Well, a perpetrator committed it, but how was he allowed to commit it? Well, he was let out of prison early through a special program. Well, that turns a story into something more than just a crime, but uh, bureaucratic culpability. And it allows uh, uh, journalism to lay blame or to explain why something happened. 
in a case in, when they otherwise couldn't. Um, and there have been, you can, you can look at those specific stories and, and what, what that has done to uh, the state budget. It's, I think that, that explains billions in, in costs um, over the last 30 years, uh, going back to 1984 when I think one or two parolees murdered a Meridian Township police officer and an East Lansing woman that was in the Blanchard administration and that set off a huge wave of uh, prison construction. In 1992, Leslie Allen Williams um, murdered four uh, girls and that set off another round of, of construction and that's how we got to a prison population of 51,000. Uh, we not only denied parole, but we built a lot of prisons in this state. Um, and I think what, uh, I think what happened in that case was at the time of the Williams case, Michigan's economy was growing. We wound up with 3.8% unemployment rate by 1999, uh, if you can imagine that right now. And so, you know, general fund revenue was growing at about 8% a year. Um, and so, I think, so the state could afford it. It could afford to build prisons. It could afford to um, uh, keep prisons, prisoners in prison longer. Um, and still provide state aid to municipalities, a uh, reasonable amount of state aid to universities, um, K-12 education, and, and the like. In fact, uh, I asked then Governor Engler in his third term uh, what he would thought of the prospects that correction spending would ever exceed the amount of money the state spends on higher, state aid to higher education, as California had, had done in the late 90s. And he said, oh, that'd be terrible. Well, as we found out in the, in the decade of the 2000, 2000s, when the economy, um, when we began shedding what will probably be about 860, 900,000 jobs this decade, um, uh, everything got cut but prisons. Um, you know, you look at the, what's the cost of tuition here now compared to 2000, it's obviously higher. Um, you know, municipalities claim they've been shorted $3 billion um, in uh, statutory revenue sharing payments over the course of that decade. We're down 2,000 law enforcement personnel across the state. Um, and I think an interesting thing happened, and it was probably in 2007, and I think that was kind of a sea change. Um, the budget shut down, the state shut down for the first time. Um, and they raised taxes. And that fall they raised taxes on business by $700 million to the new Michigan business tax. And I think what's happened since then is that the business community has become engaged and there is a second point of view to um, you know, prison quote unquote reform. Uh, in the past, any attempts to shave the prison population or make policy changes um, was basically uh, shut down because um, those, you know, legislators properly feared that a bad outcome would be harmful to their political careers. And now what you're seeing is that the business community is playing an active role in saying that um, the, 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 the 50,000 plus prison population uh, in a Midwest state where the Midwest average is closer to in the low 30,000s was simply economically unsustainable. And, um, so you have, you know, you have hearings now in Lansing where they're talking about, um, you know, a presumption of parole at 100%. Um, Senate Republicans want to apply that to new inmates only. Um, the Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce testifies, no, you have to apply it to all prisoners. Um, so I think that, you know, editorial boards are uh, much uh, more inclined to support policies like the uh, MPRI. Um, and I think it's, the, the problem right now is that it's subject to the next bad case in, in a lot of ways. And in part because the administration hasn't explained the policy. Um, and I think one of the things they needed, I think the public is prepared to, to accept it. Um, if you poll people and say, 
Ask them, should the mentally, mentally ill be in prison? They'd probably say no. Should parolees, um, is it better for a parolee to be able to read or not to read? And they would probably say, it's, yeah, it's probably a good thing that they didn't know how to read. So I think there's, if you break it up into, into different parts, I think there's broad public support um, you know, for policies like the MPRI. Uh, I think one of the issues is that in the case of term limits, it's going to be subject to change uh, by a next administration. Um, you know, that's one of the issues involving the, uh, the parole policies. Right now, it's, it's, it's executive decision making that the next governor could, could rescind as, as the previous governor did by, you know, certain parole board policy changes. Um, you know, I think some of that needs to be put in a statute. And, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, the public needs to be kind of made aware that it's kind of like a holistic system. And prisons aren't much different than any other kinds of institutions. Um, you know, almost educational, they are educational institutions. You know, you go into prison, you'll learn a lot of new things. Um, and, you'll, and you'll learn how to do better the things that got you in there in the first place. Um, so I think if you explain the public, say, well, what are we doing here? What are we doing with this program? What are we doing in prison? We're essentially remediating um, the failures, some failures of society in general. Um, and, you know, if you did another poll and you say, well, should the dropout age be 16 or 18? And I think most people would say, well, 18. And so I think the public understands that, um, you know, a, high, a minimum high school education is a good thing. And so if a, if a, if a kid doesn't have that, it should be provided somehow. Um, uh, you know, job skills, you know, all that stuff. Um, you know, it's interesting that if, if you, um, yeah, there's a number. Um, it works across purposes. I mean, we talked about the mentally ill in prison and the, the Department of Community Health budget that the Senate passed last week contains a $53 million cut to non-Medicaid community mental health services. So when, when people involved in the MPR process come out, come out of prison and uh, through that process, you know, are they gonna be able to get mental health treatment? Are they gonna be able to get job training? Um, and so I, I, I think unless it is kind of a sustained effort is made to educate the public as to what this is. Not only that it saves money, but it will keep you safer, uh, the better. Because I think that, you know, a new governor um, is probably most vulnerable in their first 18 months, two years in office, and that's when the perception of them is largely set. And so, uh, you know, if something does bad happen, um, you know, the next governor and the next legislature is gonna be really inclined to close the doors. And, you know, what they don't, they don't have to build prisons, you know, because they've got lots of empty prisons out there to, to refill. And, um, you know, it's, but, but I think there is, a, there is a sea change and, you know, I think the, the business community understands that they're never gonna get a tax cut unless they figure out a way to reduce you know, the cost of government. And the, co the, the rest of the cost of government has sh been shaved down so much in the last decade that uh, prisons are really the only place you can look at. Okay, well, let's thank our panel for those comments. Thank you to the panel. And uh, Representative Alma Wheeler-Smith has a, 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 a command performance, as, <laughs> as you all know in this town, uh, Representative Smith is running for governor. And uh, she's about to head off to an endorsement yes. meeting, so we wish you well with that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I do apologize. Thank you, John. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. Um, we have about uh, 20 minutes left. Thanks for participating. Thank you. Uh, Representative Andy Candrebus, there you go. Andy, uh, freshman legislator from 
my neck of the woods represents part of the district that I represented in ancient times. Thank you for being part of this. And we may turn to you uh, as, as these questions. If there's a question you want to deflect, John, Absolutely. Feel free. Absolutely. <laughs> Ken Dravis is great. He'll take care of it for all of us. We, we do have about 20 minutes to go, and we have a stack of questions here. If anybody else has a question, write it down on a card and pass it to the edge, and Bonnie will pick it up and bring it down to me. Uh, and, and so to the panelists, I'll ask that you try to be reasonably succinct in your answers. Be complete but succinct uh, so that we can get through as many of these as possible. Let's, let's start with this. This is a, a pretty profound question. Uh, the questioner says, our state's prosecutors seem obsessed with confi confinement and fear any action which reduces our state's prison population. That being the case, what chance do any of us have, us broadly speaking, uh, to affect policy change in this direction? And we'll throw that to Pat first. I'll, I'll start on that. I, I guess I, I don't agree that they're obsessed with that. In fact, we have many prosecutors who are actively involved at the community level with our reentry work, who, who have been um, fabulous to work with in terms of looking at policies within their own communities. But, but it is fair to say that prosecutors are, have a different role in the system. Their job is on the front end. They're, they, are, they deal with prosecuting people, sending them to prison. So you're dealing with a different piece of that. And, and I think part of it is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, prosecutors, like um, many others, you know, run for their jobs every four years on a partisan basis. And they're subject to the, the feelings and the sense from their communities. And, and those prosecutors who feel they have the support of their community and the ability to stand up and um, not have to, to spout a certain rhetoric will do that. And you see that happen from many of our, our longer term prosecutors. Those who come from a community where they may not feel they can do that aren't because that's, that's the process. They're representing the people in their community. But I mean, I deal with prosecutors a lot as a group, have a very good relationship with them. And, and um, as, as a group, I, I know they support much of what we're doing. In fact, they, their association testified in support of the uh, legislation which is looking at capping sentences at 120 percent with a presumption of parole at 100 percent. They, they support that package. I, I, think, I think Peter said it best. It's a matter of education in the communities. And right now if the public perception is one thing of what MPRI is or, or perhaps there is no perception of what MPRI is, then the prosecutors really have no uh, need to educate the public about it. That's not their role in the process. As the director said, she's, she's absolutely right about that. And they run for office. So if, if there isn't a direct impact locally with, with the public perception of the successes or perhaps the pitfalls that need additional assistance in the local community to provide transportation, let's say in, in, in the communities in Benton Harbor, uh, Southwest Michigan, Coloma, Waterville, Elite, where I represent, uh, then the prosecutor really doesn't have a whole lot of need nor cause to want to try to push that along, if you will. That's not to say that Prosecutor Cotter, in this case, isn't interested in seeing success with MPRI. In fact, he is and is very closely allied with the sheriff of Berrien County, Paul Bailey, who is very interested in the success of that program then also. Has concerns which may come up in our conversation today, but um, I, think, I think Peter said it best. It's a matter of education in the local communities and the his behalf. That's much more on the side of, of those of us on the back side of it, if you will, the public policy side and the corrections parole side. Yeah, I think some of the objections really are, fall on the whole issue of accelerated parole and, and And the, the whole idea is, was to get that down to a range between 100 and 200. I think the prosecutors are get concerned about specific cases, um, but what's what's their alternative? I mean, are, are they saying that well, no, we should keep them in at, in, in broad, broadly speaking, 150 percent of their of their minimum, 175 percent? Um, so I think from a policy standpoint, they really haven't articulated that. I think most of them do agree that. You know, it doesn't, you know, make much sense to keep somebody in, you know, for, for years longer than, than they uh, need to be. But I think, you know, under the old policies, that did make their life easier, you know. I mean, when people weren't getting out, you know, they were probably pretty happy about that. 
and so any change any change to that you know is going to going to raise alarm bells right. and the role of the prosecutors of play has certainly been one of the central elements of the politics of the MPRI in a variety of ways, both positive and negative. Let's move on to another question. Uh, if the MPRI leads to fewer prisoners, which means fewer prisons and fewer prison jobs, how do you get buy-in from corrections employees? And let's start with Pat Caruso on that. Well, um, that, that certainly is a challenge. And the, um, I challenge our employees. I say to our employees, we do not incarcerate people to provide jobs. And it is very difficult for corrections employees if you are a prison-based corrections employee. We have grown on the field side. Uh, if you look at where the increases have been in our budget and our operations, we have 33% increase on the field side. Where we've hired more agents and we've put more money into the community. But if, if you are someone who came out of the prisons, which I did until I was the director, I only worked in the prison system in our department, you're very committed to that. And you believe because you were always told that. That, I mean, that's, people are in there forever and then the longer you stay, the more likely um, the community is to be safe. And so that is an education process on our part and it's something that we have undertaken internally our department where we talk about this all the time. We've formalized it into training with our employees. We want them to see the same facts and statistics and evidence that we give to the legislators and to the public. Things like the research shows that there's no correlation between length of stay and likelihood of reoffense. Staying an extra year or two doesn't make you more likely to succeed. Things like there's not a correlation between misconduct in prison, and I'm talking about not serious misconduct, like serious assault, but the run-of-the-mill misconducts we write, like out of place and disobeying a direct order, there's not any correlation between that and success on parole. Our employees need to know that. Many of our employees get this. I have employees contact me, particularly correction officers, all the time, saying, here's someone the parole board ought to be looking at, he or she is a waste of my tax dollars. I wouldn't care if they lived next door to me. I do hear that frequently. I want to ask you a follow-up question, Pat. You, uh, you talk about how you educate uh, the employees of the department, and there's been a huge effort along those lines. What about the reward system? Uh, do people who understand and embrace the MPRI uh, find themselves more likely to be promoted and have successful careers in corrections these days, or is it neutral in that respect? I remember several years ago, it was probably at least six years ago, um, employees saying exactly that to me because, I mean, any smart person, if you work in a business, you look at what the bottom line of that business is and what the mission is, and you understand where the future is. And certainly the future in our department for several years has been revolving around reentry, which I refer to as get out and stay out. And those people who are able to conceptualize that and operationalize it in what they do clearly have been more successful in our department. Okay, so they can look at, look at the direction of the department and careers may be made. Helping the MPRI succeed. We have had many correctional officers and other prison employees who have transitioned onto the field side because they see that as the future. Not just because their prison was closing, but because they saw that as something that was rewarding and the future of corrections in Michigan. Okay. Let's turn to Representative Prost. How can we engage more Republican legislators to support policies that are supportive to prisoners and former offenders? Now, there's obviously an assumption behind that. Uh, is <laughs> We well, do that already, right? <laughs> right. What, what, what is your sense about how your caucus views the MPRI relative to the Democratic caucus? Is this, beyond just you and Representative Smith, a partisan issue or not? I think it's probably less partisan, like most everything else in the legislative process, is much less partisan than what you read on the front page of the newspaper. I think Peter did a good job of identifying the sen sensationalism is what leads, if you will, um, and the sensational arguments that we have over budgets and shutdowns and things like that lead the news stories, and legitimately so. And are there tens tensions? Absolutely. Are there tensions as it relates to good uh, discussion about issues like this? Certainly there are. I, I come at it from the perspective that education is the key to it. And 
certainly I asked an awful lot of questions of the director of the department, um, of my colleagues. Uh, it was mentioned that the prosecutors have challenges with some of the, some of the discussion today, uh, good time legislation and so forth. If we educate our colleagues about the, the impact, the benefits, the cost-benefit analysis, and trying our best to understand what a compass analysis of a prisoner is, what does that work, what does that mean, it's mainly from a perspective of, and I, and I said in my opening statements too, Jeff, if we don't educate ourselves of it, it's easier to take the perspective, no thank you, keep them all in. And term limits has had an impact on that. And that's not the purpose of today's debate, but I'm suggesting to, to all of us who are dealing with this particular issue that if, if, if legislators are coming in in the droves that they do because of term limits, they don't have near the same understanding of it. Okay. To Peter Luke. Uh, Peter, I think you, you said that the administration really hasn't explained the policy very effectively to the public in general. Did I hear you right? No, I don't think they have, and I was thinking about it, and that maybe we shouldn't call these policies anything. Maybe we should just kind of slowly shift direction, and, and because if you have a situation where you release, say, the legislature enacts a program where instead of serving 100% of your sentence, if you behave behind bars, well, you'll serve 85% of your minimum. Well, if somebody in that cohort goes out and again does something wrong, that policy will be blamed. And it seems to me, now that takes, you know, statutory change, so you can't do that under the radar. But I think with MPRI, you know, I think hopefully they can gradually just bake all this stuff into, um, into the system. And so it doesn't seem like a standalone policy, but it's more akin to, well, food, clothing, health care. Okay. Well, but in terms of, of mm -hmm. helping to build a base of public understanding, you know, mm -hmm. an event like this might help, but, but what is the right strategy for the Department of Corrections and the legislature and the governor's office to employ to connect with the mass media to get the message out to the public? Well, the... You know, if you had a prison population that it was about the Midwest average, you know, tuition at the University of Michigan wouldn't be 11000 for undergrad. It might be 8000 right? Does Anybody want $3,000? You know, I, I mean... I think all the folks in this room are on scholarship, <laughs> so it may not be a... You know, I... Peter's running for the legislature. But, um, <laughs> great argument. But, you know, you, you can't... Or do you want a tax cut? Or do you want... You know, anything you want out of the budget, there's a fixed, fixed cost to everything. And, um, you know, is there, is there a level of altruism in the, in the community? But, but this, you know, I think you can take it at another level. If you look like a, at a community like Detroit, right? Everybody talks about, oh, you know, most everybody here isn't going to be a crime victim, you know? But if you live in the city of Detroit, there's a much better chance you're going to become a victim of crime, you know? Or if you live in Flint or Saginaw, you know, you look at Flint, Saginaw, Pontiac, and uh, another one. I mean, there's there, probably Detroit. Um, uh, all have nationally uh, really extremely high high crime rates, and so from just a recidivism standpoint, if 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 somebody's less likely to come out and commit a crime, I think that's how you sell it. Why, you know, like Alma said, you're gonna everybody's gonna get out, right? So what kind of person are you letting out? If you can make the case, we're letting out a better person, right? Mm -hmm then they, they should support that law. All right. Well, it, it's very easy to imagine. In fact, you don't have to imagine it. You can read it in the papers. Those stories of the horrendous crimes committed by parolees. It's, it's very easy to point to an individual who committed a crime against another individual and tell that story in the most vivid terms. How do you tell the story about a crime that didn't happen? And there have now been hundreds or possibly thousands of crimes that would have happened if not for the MPRI that did not take place. So can, can you tell a story through the media that says, last night at 8 p.m. when Peter Luke drove into his driveway, he got out of his car, went into his house, and was not mugged? How do you make that a news story? Well, it's, it's hard, you know. I mean, you, you can take a specific example of a, you know, an, a human interest story. A guy gets out of prison and, you know, gets his associate's degree, and now he's working at a, at a car dealer, you know. But that makes it, That's about, not a story. That makes it about the prisoner right. and doesn't make it about the victim who turned out not to be right. a victim. Right. But, but that may be. It's about the legislature working together, isn't it? Right. <laughs> I mean, that, yes. People want the sensationalism to yeah. some degree. Yeah. 
So I think that's one of the challenges that's faced in telling this story powerfully and publicly. Uh, we're saying that the public is safer, safer, but are you as an individual safer? How do you know that you're safer than you would have been otherwise? So maybe it's a challenge that just sits out there. I, I do want to go back to Pat Caruso. Pat, you made a passing comment about the prison industrial complex and that the notion of maintaining a large prison population simply to keep jobs is a moral issue. Now, uh, we did have a question from somebody who went right to that point. Is it, is it cheaper for the state to house someone in prison or to potentially be adding them to the welfare rolls and pick up the bill on any negative externalities that, that may result? You know, we're turning people loose into a bad economy. Well, you know, why should they get the jobs instead of the, the, the folks who haven't committed a crime? How, uh, talk about how that's a moral issue. Well, clearly there's a lot of moral issues surrounding this. You know, do we, do we keep people in prison who are otherwise good candidates for parole because they don't have a job? You know, we're, do we, we're not running the, the poorhouse. Um, so there are all kinds of issues there. Do we keep people in prison because if we don't keep them in prison, the uh, prison will close and people will lose their jobs? I mean, there's issues that, re that revolve around that. But the fact is that when we spend so much money to run a massive prison system, there are dollars that would otherwise go into our economy that would be creating jobs for other people, would be reducing the cost of tuition, would be all sorts of things out there. And, and it's something we have to face. And I mean, if there are people who need to be in prison till the day they die, then they ought to be in prison till the day they die. But it's a, but it's a smaller number. There's a, there's a comment that I am widely credited with having made. It's, it's known around the country. I actually stole this, but I'm going to say it anyway. And that is that. We need to decide who we are mad at and who we are afraid of. And that prison beds ought to be saved for those individuals we are afraid of and not those we are mad at. And there may be people who went to prison and we were rightfully afraid of them, but over a period of years, changes have occurred in them and now we're just mad at them. We have a lot of people in prison in this country and in this state and who stay in prison because we're mad at them. If we're willing to pay an average in Michigan of $32,000 a year to be mad at people, I don't think it makes very good economic sense and I don't think it makes good moral sense either. Okay. Now we only have a few more minutes. It's 526 and we finish at 530 so this will be the lightning round and I'll start with a, a really hard question. What role does mental illness play in the rate of recidivism, and how does the MPRI address that? And I'll make that a toss-up, and John or Pat can grab it. I, I probably it's significant. It. I know <laughs> that. I know that it is very significant, and I think that's one of the significant challenges we face: is getting our arms around how we address that population. And the same can be said for drug, uh, uh, drug offenders, uh, drug courts, and so forth, are, are an attempt to do that plus some in-reach on mental health and drug, uh, uh, addressing some, some of the drug concerns that we have in the prison system too. Representative Prose is right. Our, our inability to come to terms with these issues in our communities results in many people coming to prison who otherwise would not have. If you look at mental illness, the ability to access care through local community health boards based on what the laws say, um, the inability to do that results in behaviors that land people in prison. When you're in prison, there actually is a mental health system. It's not a good place to access that, but there, there is a system that's structured. Getting people back out into that is a challenge. I will say, one area where reentry has uh, really succeeded are the numbers that deal with um, individuals formerly incarcerated, mentally ill, who have transitioned successfully back to the community. It's probably one of our highest success rates that we've seen. Okay, another quick question. Doesn't earn time, or time off for good behavior, or for doing positive things in prison, and the MPRI go hand in hand? If so, how do they fit together? Earn time is a, is a debate that has not been fleshed out nearly as well as it should be at this point in time. Uh, it's been easy to, to have an encampment and it's probably pretty fair to say it's a Republican encampment and a Democratic encampment at this point in time. And the argument has been that earned time 
uh, is, is the best way for us to reduce the costs in our prison system because we'll be letting a lot of people out that should go out or get out at 85% or thereabouts. Um, I would say that, and in fact it was partially discussed today, that that debate has not been well fleshed out at this point in time. I, I suspect that we're going to continue to try to thread together how a good time would be successful for an MPRI. But remember, we're dealing with a community uh, and other interest groups that may not have as much knowledge about what MPRI is doing both successfully moving forward. Um, and I'd caution, if I could, Jeff, briefly, we have to also make sure that we decide what it is that, that we're using as the numbers to identify success or failure or a modicum of success for MPRI. And right now, I don't know that there's a, a good understanding of what success is termed to be. Well, it depends on what you earn time for. If you earn time for not misbehaving, that's one thing. If you earn time for, you know, um, a GED, an associate's degree, any kinds of, of benchmarks that, that MPR, MPRI, uh, you know, you need to hit in order to be successful, I think they fit together perfectly well. I, I agree. I think they do, too. And, and one of the things that we sometimes forget is that the concept doesn't automatically get anyone out of prison. What it does is make people eligible to be seen by the parole board at an earlier date. So if someone is, in fact, a low-risk person who is a likely candidate for success in the community, then the parole board is able to parole them sooner than they would otherwise be able to. Very good. Well, I apologize to those of you who, who posed questions that we did not have a chance to address, but we are out of time, and I want to be respectful of your time, the time of the panel, and uh, not to mention the wonderful crew who have been covering this. Uh, I do want to thank the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy, the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and the University of Michigan for hosting this, uh, this wonderful event. And uh, uh, especially I want to thank Director Pat Caruso, Representative John Prost, uh, our wonderful reporter Peter Luke and Representative Alma Wheeler-Smith uh, for participating as panelists and please thank them once again. Thank you.